you know, I didn't go to college. I barely graduated high school. Didn't do good in the formal grading system. Um, in fact, I flunked English in my senior year because my teacher would just open the book and just be like, okay, read this page. And then she would go to that back to her desk and do nothing. <laughs> well, there's different types of success. It kind of depends on what you're thinking about. Because some people like to fantasize the successes like they're this big rock star or pop star they you know sell out like arenas or whatever right and that that is very 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 hard to obtain okay i'm i'm no longer being challenged in this position like making records is like one of the easiest things ever for me now because i've gotten so good at it and i feel like my my full potential of my skill set's not being used Right, so hello to the good listeners and the good people of the internet. Today we have with us, well, definitely, come on, he, he doesn't need introduction. Joey Sturgis himself, to, to, to say what he doesn't do, uh, he's laughing. To, to say what he doesn't do, you require her, his voice. I'll not talk, which I generally do. So thank you so much, Joey, sir, sir for joining in. It means a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, uh, shining light on accolades you have done, for the people who don't know, check out his Instagram. I'm not, I'm not gonna say. Come on. Uh, mm-hmm. How did you start as a musician at the very first? Then I'll come to the entrepreneurial part. How did I start? Hmm? Yeah. So um, it's kind of in my destiny, I I suppose, because you know my parents uh, were musicians when I was born, and I kind of grew up actually on tour. Uh, you know, they were traveling around the Midwest playing different shows. And I was, my mom was trying to raise me at the same time. Um, everyone in my family is musically oriented in some way, whether they sing or they play piano or they play an instrument, a guitar, drums, whatever. Um, so we're all sort of like, it, it, music was just kind of like a part of life for us. Uh, and believe it or not, I never, you know, when I was younger, I never intended to make music my career whatsoever uh in fact i wanted to be a video game programmer and i spent a lot of time actually programming video games in high school and messing around with computers and inventing my own little card games and printing out the cards and inviting my friends over to play the and teach them the rules and play the games and i was really into that um but then uh long story short is i ended up playing drums in a couple of bands and We were trying to record some demos and it got to this point where it was like nobody could really make it sound good so i would start messing you know my natural ability to play around with computers i was like oh well i can just jump in the computer and like you know mess with all this stuff and see if i can make it sound better and it turns out that i had like kind of a knack for it and i had no idea what i was doing at the time i mean i would open an eq plug and i was like i don't know what this does but when i move this it makes it sound better so i was Mm. just doing that and uh, out of all of my friends and all the people around us at the time, I, I guess I was sort of the best at it. And it just kind of came naturally to me. And I just started doing it for other, I started with my own bands and I started doing it for other bands. And then that became more and more and more. And that's kind of how I got into record producing and things <laughs> like that. How lucky someone has to be to be uh, raised on a tour. <laughs> <laughs> What yeah, I, would, I guess I would sit behind the amps and I would like bang on pots and pans and stuff like on stage while they were playing music. <laughs> so you grew up in the environment, you, you got the hint that, okay, this is something really interests me, right? Yeah, and but that was the thing that was weird about it is that it wasn't like, it was just like a part of life. Like, you know, some people, they, they have, ba- they're in a baseball team, they have baseball practices. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be like a baseball player for, for mm. professionally. It's just, you know, something that they do with their pastime. And that's kind of how music was for us. So I never really approached it or even thought of it as a business or as a way to earn a living. Um, and even my parents, even though they did play music for money, they would still have jobs. And so that's just the way that we looked at it. Wow. <laughs> uh, in terms of you getting into music, um, at what age did you start playing instruments, learning different things? Do you remember that? Yeah, when I was about, I'd say, eight or nine, I started to learn how to play drums. I, I took drum lessons. 
for a little while. And then I, I think when I was around like maybe 11, 12, I wanted to start playing guitar and I kind of just, you know, as I got older, I got into different things. And when I was in high school, I was in band, um, in marching band. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, I, I learned how to play like a variety of different instruments throughout the years, but I, I would say like, I'm not the best drummer and i'm not the best guitar player but if i had to pick one that i'm good at i would say probably drums mm. uh, just i have that natural ability to like just sit down on a drum set and just play whatever um i don't know why that is but i gravitate towards drums and i think a lot of my uh, like music productions have a lot to do with like the accuracy and the precision of the drums and the drum sound and i think that's just like a good all-around trait if you are trying to be like a good you know, music producer, if you have no rhythm or you're not good at drums, it's going to be rough. It's going to be hard. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was around like the high school time you were interested in drums and all of that stuff, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how many hours did you practice initially when you were like sparkling with interest? Probably a few hours, if not three or four hours a day. Um, it was just something that you, you would use to, you know, get that energy out of your body, um, burn those calories, like use your, you know, use your body. Like, uh, cause I, I'd sit on the computer like for hours uh, and hours and hours, you know what I mean? Back. So like, uh -huh. yeah. So it's, it's kind of like, okay, I want to, I want to move my body. I want to do something, but I hated working out and I hated sweating, but I could, the only thing that I would like to do like that would be drums. So I would use that as sort of my way to like, get out the energy so that was like another form of sweating you chose instead of exercising yeah yeah that's the reason you were slim <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I guess i have a good metabolism but <laughs> <laughs> um at what point like uh first and foremost before getting into you know, like serious career stuff um what did you think uh when you were interested in, in playing drums you were practicing when did you think that okay let's you know let, let's let's make this happen let, let's make it for a living I, I it's my second nature I, I play it effortlessly i can do it how, how did you like chalk this out like you sat with a pen and paper wrote down things talked to mentors producers musicians someone helped you what was that so the, the the process literally from the start of my life all the way to right now where i'm i'm running a software company for audio and plugins that entire process was completely organic. Um, it just happened naturally. It is the craziest story, but the, the quickest version I can tell is basically I was playing drums in a band. We were practicing. We started to get bored of that, and we were like, we want to play shows now. And so our idea was like, well, if we want to play shows, that means we need to show people what we sound like. So we need to record a demo. So I recorded the demo. I mixed it myself not knowing what the hell i was doing but just i i guess i knew how to make stuff sound good we put it up on myspace and we were hoping that people would hear it and be like yes we want to play shows with this band but what happened was people instead of hitting us up asking us to play shows they were hitting us up asking if they could record in the same place oh. where we where we recorded <laughs> oh and <laughs> it's funny because my vocalist at the time was getting really upset about this he was like He's like, I don't know what's going on, man. They just keep asking me, like, can I record? Can I record? And I, I just, it, it's really annoying. It's really frustrating. And I'm like, well, I guess what if we just, maybe we record these bands and then while they're in the studio, we can like convince them to play shows with us or something. So we did, I started doing that. Um, and those demos or those recordings started to make their way out into the universe and people started to listen to it and, and talk about it. And that led to even more bands that wanted to record. Mm -hmm. And Keep in mind, I was not in this situation at all going, yeah, I'm going to start a recording studio and make all this money. I was just like, whatever, dude. Like, oh, you guys want to record some songs? Sounds cool. <laughs> you know, um, I wasn't even charging that much money at the time. But after like a year or two of that, it kind of was like, okay, this is becoming a thing. Um, and at, meanwhile, I worked at a computer shop repairing computers. And uh, I was at this... Um, treasurer's office and this was an unusual day because usually we would do these service calls me and my boss would jump in a car drive to a location fix the computers go back to the office but on this day we had two service calls at the same time which was oh. unusual 
So he was like, okay, I'm going to drop you off at this location. Then I'll go over to this other location. We'll both do the jobs at the same time. And then we'll go back. And I was like, I handed the, I finished the job. I handed the invoice over to the lady that was going to pay me. And I remember looking down at that invoice and I remember seeing the numbers that we're charging them, you know, we're charging them like $75. And I was thinking to myself, I only made just now just made $6 because I'm getting paid $6 an hour. I'm the only person here and I did all of the work. And I was thinking to myself, my boss is going to get like 60 something dollars out of this and I'm only going to get six. And I was like, that sucks. (laughs) And so what kind of happened naturally at that point was I was making more money on the weekends because I would go to work Monday, Friday, then Saturday, Sunday, or fr- sometimes Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would record bands and I was mm-hmm. making more money the extra box doing that. that. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute, my paycheck is $254, but I just made like $450 on the weekend. Um, maybe What's I should happening? quit this job. <laughs> yeah. So that's when I took the recording thing more seriously. And then I, basically did a couple of records that caught the attention of this guy named uh, Craig Erickson from Oregon. He was starting a record label called rise records. Rise and Rachel. yeah. And he, he like reached out to me and was like, Hey, uh, I really am impressed with what you're doing over there. I would like to actually be your manager if you would be interested. And uh, my first impression was just like, hell no. I've only ever heard <laughs> the worst things about managers. So I was scared out of my mind. I was like, there's no way I'm about to get involved in all that stuff because I've always heard bad things. Um, I thought about it some more, though, uh, because I was like, what if it turns out to be really good, though? And so my idea was, okay, I'm going to give this guy like a list of demands. Like if you can accomplish these like five to ten things in the next couple of years as being my manager, then uh, then we can do this. (laughs) <laughs> and uh so he actually uh complied he was like okay yeah sounds Let's good <laughs> and uh the things that i had on there were things like you know i wanted to work with adam d i wanted to do an, an album for metal blade like i just wrote down this crazy stuff at the time for me i was like there's no way any of this is ever going to happen and he made every single thing on that list happen in the first like two years so that was the birth of essentially our uh music production business and and my serious approach to doing it um full time and then it kind of came full circle so i did that for a number of years um about 10 years oh, wow. and started to figure out like okay i'm i'm no longer being challenged in this position like making records is like one of the easiest things ever for me now cuz i've gotten so good at it and i feel like my my full potential of my skill set's not being used And I heard a quote, uh, I was also kind of like, not super happy with my income. I mean, I was making great money, don't get me wrong. But at at the time, I looked at it and I was like, okay, I've got 12 months in a year, I can do about 10 records in that time. And there's no way I could get anything more done because that's just all the time that you have in the year. So that means my income is going to be capped at this much unless I can charge more for the records. But it's limited. and I heard a quote from Bill Gates and he w- and he was talking yes. about how like you you create a uh, a piece of software and yeah, then you exactly. can sell it infinite number of times. Still and I was like time. I was thinking to myself I need to create a product that I can sell infinite number of times. And so that's when I got the idea to start doing the drum samples. So I would have a band come in, we would record the record and then at the end I would have the drummer sit down and sample every single drum and hit it like you know, a bunch of different ways so that you could basically recapture that entire sound of that drum set. And I was doing that for myself because when I would make the albums, I would want to have the ability to replace anything in the album in case I wanted to change something. And this is before I knew that this is before I figured out that you could just record drums last and, and then you don't have to worry about it. But back then this is the way I was thinking. So I would make this epic drum sample thing for myself and then use it like maybe two or three times. And then it would just sit on my hard drive going to waste. And I was like, I could probably just put this on a website and sell it to people if they want it, like if they want my sounds, you know? Mm-hmm. So I started that. And in the first year, we did $50,000 in revenue from oh, the drum samples. Wow. And that's when I was like, okay, I just oh. unlocked, 
I just Bill Gates, something thank you. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I would do That's how I was like, okay, this is how I'm going to scale my income. So I'm going to have the records and I'm going to make the drum samples. So we're doing that. We're doing that process. And then I'm getting to the point where I'm like, okay, drum samples are not enough. Like we got to take it to the next level. And then it's like, mm -hmm. okay, now we're doing guitar Product presets. Catalogs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it <clears throat> went on to audio plugins and now a full-fledged software company. And, and so that's kind of the whole story of how it all naturally progressed. Holy shit. <laughs> that's a lot, <laughs> lot to die. I, I, like, I'll do the podcast. I'll record this. I'll edit this later on. I'll see it once more. Then I'll make it, uh, you know, uh, public. I have to understand certain things. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to learn. A lot to learn from you, man. A lot, lot to learn. Yeah. Uh, what was your age back then when you were thinking of all of this? You was you were making records, having all of these thoughts of okay, you know, let's automate businesses, let's make money by selling a product multiple number of times, scalability, and all of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that happened in my twenties. I I started off uh, recording bands when I was nineteen. Oh um, my god. Yeah. So from nineteen to twenty nine was kind of that period of time where it was like just like record after record after record. And in that time period, I probably did like 110 so something albums. Um, yeah, if you look up my discography, it's pretty insane. But I got to tell you, man, it was a grind. Like there was not a free yeah. moment in my life whatsoever. <clears throat> like I never had time off. I was completely just stuck to that chair and that computer recording band after band after band. But I, I was also one of those early adopters of anything on the internet. So as soon as Twitter existed, I made an account and started tweeting. As soon wow. as MySpace came out, I was the first person on there uploading songs. As soon as, you know, the next thing comes along, as soon as you could have a, an account on Facebook, I was on there. Um, so during that whole process, I guess I was kind of building up an audience. I didn't realize that's what I was doing. I just thought, oh, I'm getting more followers. This is cool. But that all ended up working out in my favor when I did launch like the drum samples and then the guitar presets and wow. then the plugins. All of those people were there waiting for me to basically create a product for them. I just never thought of they it. They converted that way. into customers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I actually had a 10 year head start. Uh, versus pretty much anywhere anyone else that's starting right now because mm. I was building up that audience. I mean, yeah. I even had one of the first YouTube accounts back in 2006. We were uploading um, studio vlogs because I, I even had, like I went to Walmart and I bought one of those old school like camcorders that's got the oh. tape and everything. And I would record like, like stuff <laughs> that's happening in the studio. Then at night when the session was done, like around 11 p.m., I would had this device where I could record the the video footage back into the computer and then Whoa. chop it all up and edit it and upload it onto YouTube. I was doing that same back day. in like 2006. Yeah, same day. Holy shit, lots of work, man. <laughs> so that was building an audience too, right? So I had people following me on Twitter, people following on MySpace, and then people watching my YouTube channel because I would be working with the bands that they, you know, they want to see what's going on in the studio. What's the band doing? Like, it could be bands like the Dead Wars Prada or, um, uh, I mean, any of those bands from the early rise days, Attack Attack is another good example of Mice and Men. Everybody wanted to tune in and watch what was happening. And so I, I took advantage of that. And I knew that, you know, there was something to this YouTube thing. I didn't know exactly what that was going to be either. But I was like, I know that I want to be on there and I know that I want to be seen. And uh, so that's what we did. How do you, how easily do you explain these things, man? After to learn speaking from you, um, <coughs> there was in two thousand six. So that was like the onset of internet. Internet was coming; it was becoming popular. People recognized that this was happening. Okay, what is Google Chrome? What is this Orkut and all of these stuff? So it was that time, right? So uh, in terms of you being an early adopter, or what we can say as a first mover advantage, right? Uh, was your brain like always open to innovative and new things? Like I, I should be, you know, learning this first because I want to explore my capabilities, how well I perform at a certain project. What was the thing? Like you pushed your limits all the time? Because I can uh, yeah. conclude from your words that hours and hours of sitting on a chair in front of the computer mixing for 10, 15 years, it's it's fucking a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm I, this is like one of my, I guess, secrets is that I am a self-learner. Um, 
you know, all you'd have to say to me is one thing. Like if you're just like, you know, aircraft mechanics, I'm come like, to a okay. podcast and you will come. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I hear that, that word, that's something I never heard of before. I, I Google about it. I read, you know, I research as much as I can. I, I, I want to learn anything I can. Um, like when I was in high school, I, I bought countless books of how to program video games, video game graphic programming for 3D, visual basic game programming, C++ game programming, blah, 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 blah. Like I have hundreds of books on these topics and I would I would buy them. I'd get so excited. It would show up on my door. I would open it. I would start going through it. I would start doing the examples. Like this is just my nature. It's like how I am. So that's why I think I was able to figure out like how to do uh, a recording studio, how to make records, how to edit, how to mix, how to master um how to make drum samples how to make my own website where i could put my own drum samples and sell those how do i how do i get the money into my account how do i now turn this into a business okay how do you start an llc how do you file your taxes with the irs how do you pay other people online and how do you get employees you what do people you do? Team, this, yeah. that, huh? i just go on and on and on it's like i, I can't stop I, I, that's my I, you know some people they get uh, fixated on like video games mm-hmm. or sports or whatever i don't have any of that stuff my brain just wants to learn how things work and just go for it and i just keep doing that and I, i'm at, at a point now where you know we're operating on a much larger scale and i'm learning how to become better leader how to become a better mm-hmm. boss how to deal yeah. with like human resource situations mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know it just never ends there's there's always a challenge ahead and uh, i love to be challenged so i just keep going for that not like the boss who paid you 6 dollars <laughs> <laughs> I, i i wonder what he's up to these days but maybe he's still running a <laughs> give him give him a shop. call invite, invite him for a dinner like bro come on man Let's have a dinner. <laughs> He'll be like, "Holy shit! Can I get a job at JST?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> How were you as a student? Because to be honest, if I, if I explain a certain thing here in India, what generally happens is a lot of emphasis is given on education, and I'm I'm not saying education is bad. It, it, it's this or that or shit. Um, a lot of emphasis is given on education, but from the onset of the internet like as how i view education is just a piece of knowledge for doing a work okay if you not if you want to know how to make bottles you just learn them you don't go through 14 years of schooling to learn making bottles it just takes an hour to learn for example right so right now there's a cusp of change everyone is going through and also ai being the threat to a lot of industries especially the music education in india what happens uh, a lot of emphasis given on education like you have to be educated get a job have 15 billion degrees stamped onto yourself even if you don't know how to do the fucking work you have, if you have a degree you'll get a decent paying job and uh, then do whatever you like this word passion it's, it's very oversold these days you know right follow your heart follow your, follow your passion but what's the scene over there what's the scene in the west Uh, that brings me to the question how were you as a student in high school and did you go to college when you were doing mixing bands producing learning all that you can pushing your limits and you know exper- experiencing things well i think that you touched on a good point which is uh you know the traditional form of education that is still pushed upon our society in even in different cultures it's a little different but it's still kind of this main concept of you know you need to go to like a formal disciplined like learning experience throughout your you know your early adulthood or your early childhood and i feel like um that's going to change it, i mean it already is changing that the internet has obviously changed almost every industry in existence uh oh, especially knowledge. yeah and so knowledge and education is now sort of a commodity like you can just kind of find it for free pretty much anywhere because there's a lot of people willing to to explain what they're doing or teach it online uh like myself <laughs> and um because of that i i think there's kind of two things to really look at and one well there's one thing to look at and there's two sides of it and that's discipline because if you don't have self discipline you're going to need that environment that will require you to show up to school at 8 in the morning and 
till 3.30 or whatever and go to class and do this and do that and do your homework and this is due by Friday. If you don't have discipline, that helps you learn. If you have self-discipline and you have the ability to say, okay, I am going to teach myself. I am going to take time, carve it out of my schedule to learn about this. I want to learn about this. Then you kind of don't need that formal education situation anymore. It's it's not like school has all the secrets because now the secrets are online. So if, if you have the ability and the discipline to go after it, then that's what I recommend people do because you can go much faster. Mm-hmm. You can change the pace of the learning. You can change the you can pivot quicker. Like if you're in school and your major is like, you know, English, well, you have to stick with that. Like you can't just like change mid semester, you know, but like if you're online and you're like, ah, you know what? I'm not really digging this English crap. Let me do some math or, or science or whatever. And like then you go down that route, like as soon as you have the passion to do so. And that creates a faster learning experience. So I think we're going to see an interesting time where, there's a lot more going to be a lot more people like myself where I, you know, I didn't go to college. I barely graduated high school, didn't do good in the formal grading system. Um, in fact, I flunked English in my senior year because my teacher would just open the book and just be like, okay, read this page. And then she would go to that back to her desk and do nothing. She didn't teach us. <laughs> she, you know, and, and I would just literally fall asleep in that class. I couldn't handle it. It was so boring to me. And, and I, I'm kind of one of those people where like, I have to be engaged to mm. to be learning and so if there's no engagement in the class then i'm i'm checking out so i flunked that didn't graduate high school had to come back and do summer school had a different teacher for english a wow. got an a plus and graduated in summer school which is the worst thing ever like because you don't go to your graduation party you don't get to go to prom you don't do like there's all these things that you don't do when you graduate in summer school so that happened to me but uh you know i was a self-taught self-learner once i got out of school i was like all right i'm gonna do this i'm gonna record music i'm gonna do all these bands i'm gonna make these products like i just kind of took it from there and that's that's my own i have the discipline to do that and i think that not everyone has that so that's the key i think for the formal education system is that if you don't have discipline then it can be useful for that Or if you have a mentor that can help you uh, accomplish or have that discipline to go after something, then that also would work too. Fantastic point, man. Fantastic point. Like, there's also this this interesting thing that, you know, also internet is a vast pool of knowledge. We can gather knowledge, but the problem is the source from which the knowledge is coming. Because if, if there's good, there's crap as well. So what was your way of filtering out the good information and avoiding the crap? Like somewhere, you know, people will be saying, okay, that's a good, know. uh, yeah. You almost have to have like a barometer for, for bullshit. This is mm. the thing that is so hard. <laughs> like I, I, my dad, you know, he's, he's in his sixties now and he'll, you know, he'll call me and he'll be like, I think I got a virus on the computer. It keeps saying that I like ah, I need to, and I'm pops. like, dad, <laughs> I'm like, dad, that's a fake pop-up thing. It's not a, you know, so he doesn't have that barometer of like what's what's real and what's not. And I, you know, me growing up on the internet, I think like, I, I, you know, I was one of the first people to have like a dial-up modem and be able to access the early, early internet. So I kind of grew up with it and I learned how to tell the difference between like, you know, somebody trying to sell you something or trying to tell you something that's not real because i would always look at it like this if i can find like you know a dozen sources that are all saying the same thing then maybe there's some truth to that and that's kind of maybe what the answer is um and the the second thing that really skyrocketed my understanding and my learning experience on the internet was forums and being a part of a community where people challenge each other i you know i was in this forum called the the andy sneep forum which was on the ultimate metal forum.com and in that forum, it's so fun man, because almost every character from that day, from those days are they're doing something crazy awesome now. Like we were all part of like a uh, what do you call it? Uh, they they have these out uh, in California where it's it's a, a bunch of programmers living in a house together and they're trying to. Oh. Um, I, I forget what that word is. There, there's well, a word okay. for that. Uh, incubator, incubator. Incubator. So, huh? Yeah, yeah. So the the Sneep Forum was like an incubator for like massive successful people because like 
you know, uh, you've got Misha Mansoor that came from out of there. He, <laughs> he started periphery and get good drums and all this stuff. And then you've got like, um, uh, uh, this guy named Lassie, he, he's doing some cool stuff with software or with, uh, digital products and, and, you know, people like myself who have gone on to create like JST and drum forge and, and do all these big records and things like that. And so that community, all the people in there, like we were basically challenging each other, pushing each other, like somebody would upload a mix and then the next person would be like, that mix sounds like shit. Like, and then you, it would make you want to like, you know, uh, get better. And, and uh, pe people would, uh, you know, criticize your kick sound or your snare sound. And then you'd be like, ah, oh, shit, I got to get it better. So it, it was kind of this really cool competitive environment that really like, I, I, you know, I think during those formidable years, like it was, it did so much for the, the uh the quality that you were after that the seeking that quality like how do i get it better how do i get better and it just kind of forced everyone to learn together let's come to the entrepreneurial side of, of, of the music industry um an interesting question that is on a scale of one to ten how easy it is to make a living or a career out of music in the west according to your experience? Well, there's different types of success. It kind of depends on what you're thinking about. Because some people like to fantasize the successes like they're this big rock star or pop star. They, you know, sell out like arenas or whatever, right? And that, that is very, very, very hard to obtain. Um, then you have people that like a lot of people that I know who will just get into a nice city. Um, you know, let's, let's say Nashville, Tennessee, something like that and <laughs> play, you know, play four or five, six shows a week, um, uh, at, you know, restaurants, bars, um, things like that and make a decent living. And, and that's very obtainable. Now that's not the same dream, right? Cause most of the time you're probably playing other people's songs uh or you're you know you're doing side gigs on uh throughout the you know before 5 p.m when everyone starts going out to bars you're doing something maybe your office job or you're doing you know side jobs or whatever just to make ends meet but i know a lot of people who are perfectly happy with that you know they they just want to play music and they just want to make money with it but there's that other side of of the music industry which is kind of like the entertainment industry right where people you know fantasize of being like these these big uh, popular uh, celebrities or rock stars or whatever, what have you. So I think that if you're, uh, you know, coming from a different country and you're coming to America and you have these dreams of being like this big pop star or whatever it is, um, just know that like that happens to about one to three people every mm -hmm. maybe three to five years, period. You know, out of like, 10 million people, three people get. But. Yeah, like out of 300 million people, like one or two people will become the next big pop star, right? So, so that's that's more harder than uh, clearing our government exams in India. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, you could come to America and you could, if you're a good performer, like you're a good uh, guitar player or something, you could jump on a cruise ship and work six to nine months out of the year, travel the world, get free food and and get paid pretty well. Um, now that's not the same dream as standing up on stage in front of 20,000 people and mm. having them all sing your song. Um, but it's a living and it is music. So there's different, uh, it's different things to consider for sure. Mm. Have you been to India yourself with, with the band, with other productions? <clears throat> uh, when I was younger, I kind of got exposed at an early age to, to performing live. Uh, when I was nine, I played in front of like 3000 people at a red cross oh. benefit. And, uh, it was funny because the band that I was in, I like, I was nine years old, but everyone else in my band that I was in was like 23, 24. <laughs> so it was kind of this Smallest. funny little thing. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm like the little kid on the drums. I can barely reach the, <laughs> yeah. I'm like doing this with my arms so I can hit the cymbals and stuff. <laughs> and it's just, it's hilarious. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was performing in front of thousands of people at a younger age and, um, you know, kind of grew up in that environment. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't abnormal. I, you still get nervous, obviously, cause you, you want to do a good job and you want to 
you know, perform and, not and enter- yeah, you don't want to suck in front of a bunch of people. So that's a thing. That's always a thing. Um, so yeah, but I, it wasn't like anything that I really aspired to do. Like it was kind of cool for a little while. Like I, I did enjoy doing it in high school. We played some pretty cool shows uh, when I was in this, uh, a bigger band at that point, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like, Oh, I want to go on tour and I want to be in this big band. I, I never looked at it that way. It was just a fun thing to do on the weekends pretty much. Hmm. <clears throat> Um, do you ever visit India? Uh, no, I've never traveled that far. That's that's. Uh, what are you planning to? <laughs> we'll see. Because uh, in the in my when I was um, in my early twenties, I was like kind of not terrified of traveling, but it was more like this thing where it's just like I didn't have any interest in it, um, and I kind of was afraid of like flying, and. Then uh, as I got older, I I started to travel a little bit more, like just, you know, baby steps. Like I would go to, you know, Seattle, Washington or something and then come back and... Small trips. Now, yeah, now I travel a lot. Like I travel almost every other week I go somewhere. So uh, we're, you know, we're very experienced travelers. I made my way over to, you know, Iceland, Australia, Europe, uh, Canada, um, you know, Hawaii, like... So it's coming, you know, I, I, I want to definitely visit like, um, you know, Spain is high up on my list and Italy is another really high up country, but, uh, I do want to visit, uh, all different countries and travel the world and see everything that there is to see while we're here. You know, it's, it's life is, is too short. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, soon, hopefully soon. So, mm -hmm. I'll mail you huh? when you will come. I'll get a hint and then mail you. Come, Joey. Yeah. Let's have some butter chicken. Uh, yeah. India's okay. For all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? My my wife loves Indian food, so yeah, should be in heaven. <laughs> so, so the <laughs> next next podcast will be with your wife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it it will be F and B podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Master Chef India. Um. Now, an interesting question. That is. How are you seeing AI? Uh, man, I mean, uh, it's like um, technology is the future for the music industry or is it going to take away loads of jobs? Because as an entrepreneur, you are also a visionary. You have to think five, ten years abroad. What do yes. you see? Okay, so here's my theory of what's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be basically like a renaissance of content and art. Uh, so AI is going to creep its way into our our natural process of creating art. It's going to help us write lyrics, help us write songs. Then it's going to actually write some of the songs and some of the lyrics. And then it's going to write songs. And then it's going to write albums. And then we're going to get to this point where you're going to have like an, a fully AI band that's popular and crushing it. Uh, but through that we're going to re realize and this is this is much in the same way that you would pay a uh, hundred dollars to go to a world famous museum to look at a painting that was done in the 1700s is that that oh. was a real thing that was a real thing that somebody sat down and did with their hands and with their <laughs> their own creativity so you're gonna have we're gonna go all the way up to this peak of artificial intelligent creations and art and things and then we're gonna it's all gonna fall back down to i want to watch a person stand in front of me and sing that for real i want to watch a person mm. yeah a natural performance a natural piece of art something that mm. someone actually created out of their own um creativity and with their own two hands and their own voice and things like that so we have to go through that and uh, you know we're already seeing a little bit of it like you're seeing it when in the nft space uh oh. i feel like nfts were like the talk of the town for the, the last year and a half and, and some, now, of, some like, of the nfts and paintings sold for millions of dollars like people are buying yeah. all of those yeah. and now i i barely hear anything about nfts anymore exactly. and i know that, that exactly it, and and that's that's also an example of like how fast like technology can change things and how fast software uh changes things in different industries and i think that in music, it's still going to be this slow thing that happens over years and years and years, but people are going to realize in the end that it comes back to human creation, human created art, 
and a natural ability to use music as a language to speak to each other uh, emotionally. And that's really what music is all about. And I think that there's no way in hell that AI will ever create the same emotions that somebody can portray through human created art. It just will yeah. never happen because AI doesn't have emotions and never will. Uh, it, can, it can kind of pretend like it does and it can learn about how emotions work and things like that, but it just, it won't be like what humans have and what humans can give. And so, yeah, we're going to see, we're going to rise up to a peak and it's all going to crash down and it's going to come right back to real art. So people who are not choosing uh, music as a career, a performing artist, a producer, are they doing a right job? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, if you love to sing and you're pretty decent at it, I, I would definitely keep <laughs> pretty, pretty decent I, would keep, at it. <laughs> I, I would keep doing it. You know, I would keep doing it. I think it's, it's an amazing thing. It really is. Music is like one of the most incredible things that we have, like, between us humans and and that we could we you know it's amazing that you can like take your hand and like you know hit these pieces of metal and have it like make tones that go out into the air like it's it's magical you know it's it's mm -hmm. it's true magic so uh, i i think we have to respect that we have to uh chase that we have to continue that uh it's very very important for humans um and for like our species, you know, there's, you don't see other animals making music. So <laughs> other, other than birds, birds do sing. So there's that's that, what singers, but, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Hmm. That's a real uh, interesting answer. I was wondering because right now there's a common study that happened like four to five days back uh, by, by an university that showed like they, they, they got a goddamn robot. They, they programmed him. And uh, him or her, I don't want to go into gender equality. <laughs> Program the robot. Uh, the robot made closer than 150,000 songs in, in an hour's time. I was like, yes, finally, someone's taking our jobs. Great. We'll be broke on streets. So we want bread and water. <coughs> and now we have an interesting answer over here. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but it's kind of like uh, the practicality of it all, right? Like if you go in an airport and there's a self-playing piano that's in the background and it's just, it's just reading a MIDI file and playing a piano song. It's like, okay, that's I happening. That's in, the back, mm -hmm. that's in the background, you know, cool. I'm, I'm enjoying it a little bit, but it's a whole different thing when there's a guy over there mm. and the guy's doing the same thing. And even if it sounds 99% the same, obviously it's going to be a little different because it's a human doing it. But just the fact that there's a guy there that is using his time to perform the same song and the same setting for the same, even the same volume, all the, all the same things. It's just the fact that there's a person spending their time and their knowledge and their creativity to do that for you uh -huh. is a, is a thing that like AI will, you know, never be able to touch. Robots mm -hmm. will never be able to touch that. Yeah. <coughs> legit, legit. That, that's a very good answer. Um, how far is this revolution um, from happening? Five, 10 years, like the peak and then drop. Uh, that's a tough one. I don't really know. I don't think anyone knows, but I I do know that it's already being uh, incorporated. You know, like uh, I know a few songwriters that are using it to help them finish lyrics. I know people who are using it to uh, scratch out rough ideas. Like they want to, okay, what, what, what would it sound like if I created a, a pop beat in C major and in, in G minor, and I want to uh, and I want to hear that at fourteen different tempos, and I want it to be these instruments, and you can just type this into a computer, and then it's like here you go, and you can listen to those things without having to like sit down for a whole day and map all those things out, and then manually put it all together and hit play, and then you know what I mean, like so it's already being used and I, I just don't know how it's going to affect things. I, I mean, obviously there's already, there's the, uh, what's it called? The gigabots that can mm. perform the 24 seven grind band that performs on YouTube uh, live stream right now. It does it like you can just go look it up and it's playing right now and it's mm. all generated by AI. And so it's like, is that going to be entertaining? I don't know. Like it, it just, just depends on how people are going to use it in at least in the marketplace, how it's going to become, is it going to become a product? Is it going to become 
music that you'll stream on Spotify is going to become something you'll download or you'll buy. I don't know the answer to that, but that when that happens, that will be sort of like the the pivot point, which is going to be like, wait a minute, I'm spending my money on this. I'm I'm spending my time on this. Would I rather do that with a human that I can connect with that has like wow. an emotional connection or what do I want to keep doing it with computers? Mm-hmm. And that's like, you know, that there's different people, you know, different. That's why NFT space even worked at all is because some people connect with a digital picture of something that somebody created versus a guy who wants to walk into a museum and, and smell the old dust coming off of the canvas, you know, like that's, there's different things. And, uh, mm-hmm. Time will tell which one's going to succeed. But I, I think that ultimately, because we are human, we will yearn for that human connection and that human reality of, yeah. of art. And it'll it'll come back to that. I don't know how many years, but it, it will happen. It's the same thing like you see in um like a resurrection of an old music style or music genre. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, when it yeah. when the eighties come back in and do synth wave, and now it's like it's kind of 80s and it sounds kind of 80s but we're making it in 2023 and we're using <clears throat> modern production techniques like that's all lo-fi that all and this low pass filter and shit <laughs> yeah this all happens on a cyclical nature and so it'll be the same thing with ai hmm. in terms of looking at ai all the plugins and softwares you use as musicians the door even that's a that's a form of ai right yeah, I mean, uh, we're starting to see AI. It has not taken our jobs. Hmm. It has like actually yeah. helped us, uh, you know, delegate work, a certain part of it. Yeah, yeah. It, mm. it, it's in the record-making process already. Um, mm. You know, it's being used to, uh, let's say a singer said the wrong word. Well, now you can use AI to, like, correct the word without Ta-da. having to go back in the studio. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like... Uh, how far is that going to go? I, I don't really know, but I, you know, I try not to get too stressed out about it because people are going to naturally uh, appreciate the, a, a, a person doing this kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Otherwise our wives or and husbands would have been robots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody would just interact with robots all the time. You would eat food made by a computer, a, a machine, you would, you know, and Have sex. your friends would be robots. Yeah, like that's that's not going to work. You, you, I, you know, maybe for some people, but in the end, like if if it came down to it, I, I think humans will prevail on this. Yeah. Uh, it's going to affect the industry in different ways. That's for sure. But there, not all hope is lost. Uh, you know, music was created by humans. It's for humans. It's an emotional connection. It's a language. You know, robots will get good at it, but that won't, it really won't matter. It, it'll, at the end of the day, you'll still want to see a guy next to a campfire playing an acoustic guitar or a band on stage or whatever. Um, doesn't matter how far we take it. It's still going to have that, that human element is going to be desired. Yeah. Hmm. No doubt. Yes. Yes. That's a eye opening answer. <laughs> um, now, if you would kindly like, you know, shower some of your light on creating Joey Sturgis Stones and Drum Forge and also you run an academy where people, producers can learn. So how all, did all of this started? And the important question before this is, did you go to a business school to learn business or you shower through the internet? As you said, you, was a, you were a self-learner and gathered the information, learned from videos, podcasts, entrepreneurs. What was the way and how did you build all of this? Yeah, I, I learned online. Um... Wow. <laughs> it, it's really not even like purchasing courses or anything. It's just kind of like uh, having a natural intuition for how things should work. Ask, um, asking important questions and searching them online. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Knowing who to talk to uh, when you do need that outside influence. And then um, having goals. You know, I think one of the biggest things that people make a mistake of, I call it the bow and arrow effect. Um you know, if I was to ask you, how much money do you want to make? You'd be like, as much money as possible. Well, that's not an answer because uh, you're just shooting, you're just aiming your bow and arrow at the sky and just letting the arrow go away versus a target, a bullseye. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a spot right over there. I want to hit that exact spot. Let me aim for it and shoot. That is the exact way that i've accomplished pretty much anything is having that bullseye 
and selecting what that is and then aiming for it and shooting at it until I hit it. And so in business, it's not how much money do you want to make as much as possible. It's okay. How do we make, you know, $1 million? Well, we make a product. The product costs $99. How many of those do I need to sell to get to a million dollars? Okay. This many numbers that this many copies. Okay. How many is that per month? How many is that per week? How many is that per day? All right. I have to sell, you know, $2,800 worth of this product every day. How do I do that? Uh, uh, got to start a social media account. Got to start getting followers. Got to start putting content in front of them. You know, you just have to reverse engineer it from that tiny goal. Well, not a tiny goal, but from that little bullseye point, if you don't pick what that is, you'll ne- you're never going to get there because you're just going to be shooting arrows into the air. You know, you can't aim high. You have to aim at something. Yeah. And so, and this is going to be hard for some people because they're going to say, well, my bullseye is me on a stage in front of 20,000 people singing and everyone is singing my song. Okay. Well, that's not very constructive. How did you get there? Uh, I mean, you could use that as your bullseye, but now you have so much reverse engineering to do that it's it's overwhelming. Mm. So I always say, you know, set your bullseyes at, in steps. Maybe just your first bullseye is like, okay, well, I know I want to be, I want to start my own business. Let me set my target. My first target is going to be starting an LLC, getting all my papers filed, you know, picking my business name, getting a logo created. That's my first bullseye. And takes you a month to do that. All right, cool. What's the next one? Now I want to make my first profit or I want to make my first sale or I want to launch my first product. Okay, cool. Do that. And then and even before that, learn how the fucking business works. Just don't jump yeah. in with $20,000 on the feed. <laughs> like, yeah, like the, the aim and shoot. Like the aim is, okay, there's, there's the bullseye. I'm aiming for it. That's how do we shoot? learning. How do you hold the arrow? Oh. Yeah, that's the learning part of it, right? And then the shooting is the Excuse stepping me. out of your comfort zone. That's taking the step, taking action, executing, actually you know, just thinking about stuff doesn't get you anywhere because yeah. you can think all day long. Ideas are a dime a dozen. What matters is execution, actually taking action to accomplish the thing that you, yeah. the to get to that bullseye, you have to fire that arrow. So that's yeah. the confidence. That's the action step. So I, I, I tell people this all the time and I think that it gets overlooked. And I think that's the difference between a person who succeeds and doesn't is because they just don't understand how to, discipline themselves in in the goal process of getting to your next step set the goal learn how to get there then take the actions that are necessary to get to it where else can we get information like this <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the problem with you know a lot of creative people because when we think we'll do this we'll do this we write down stuff talk with people and then come back home and watch a film and smoke and then sleep yeah so why don't we execute like it's, it's it like it's, it's because of fear sometimes um i don't know i think it's just some people are i i kind of believe in this idea that there's two types of people or like three types it's like you've got dreamers who <laughs> are they they literally fall in love with just dreaming Mm-hmm. and don't ever do anything they just want to idealize and dream about this and oh this would be amazing and i have this vision but they never take action and sometimes those people end up in in very successful situations because you can take a visionary and you can give them an executive leadership background with all these different people who know how to execute and that yeah. person leads you know and then now you have you know amazon or whatever right a GSD. Um, <laughs> yeah, or or SpaceX or or Tesla. Like, you know, these are big companies that have a visionary and then people who actually take action. Then you have the people who um will wake up every single day for 10,000 days in a row at five in the morning and go to the factory and press the button and make the thing and do and use the hammer or whatever. Mm-hmm. They'll grind and grind and grind and grind and just stay at the same level in their life forever. But they they have that that just grind mentality their drive and, and then i think you have a kind of a third type of person which is like they're more of like a cure they're curious they're like well how do i get this done and that, that's i think where i fall 
um, I do have the discipline to grind and I, and I can just wake up and do the same thing over and over and over. It, it, I've done that. That's how drum editing works. You wake up, you move the kick drum, you move the snare, you do that 10,000 times until you go to sleep. Um, but the curious people are the ones who solve problems and business is about solving problems. problems I mean, that's yeah. literally what it is, you know? So I'm a natural problem solver. That's why I'm good at business, you know? And it doesn't mean you know, there's all kinds of problems. There's your customer has a problem. Well, how do I make my vocals sound good? We'll use this vocal plugin. But then the vocal plugin itself is a problem that you had to solve. Well, how do I type the code <laughs> to create the piece of software that solves the problem for the user? But then it's like, okay, well, there's another problem because how do I find the programmer and pay for his bills so that he can type the code that creates the piece of software that solves the problem for the person who wants to make the vocal sound good? And then it's like, okay, well, how do I create an organization and a work culture where people want to be a part of this company because they want to help the company succeed so that then we can then create the sales and the money that can then pay for the people's jobs so that they can then do the software to then create the product for the person that solves the on and on and on and on. So this is like the way of thinking that you need to have if you like actually want to achieve like big things because that this is one of my, my favorite quotes and I forget who said it, but it's, if you want to make more money, you have to solve bigger problems. And mm -hmm. this is the reason why you have these big companies like Amazon who are so wildly successful and make so much money is because think of the problem that they solve. Yeah. You pick up your phone and you're like, I need this. You press a button and then it's on your door like 12 hours later. That's crazy. That's mm -hmm. a huge problem that they solved. And they had to do all kinds of shit along the way to get to that point. Like, you know, a lot of people like to pick on Jeff Bezos and they say, well, you know, he should give away all of his money. He has way too much money. Yeah, yeah and this is a culture, a more culture in India because we think is, you know, tax the rich. I'm like, no, you yeah. haven't seen the blood, sweat and tears that has gone into creating that. And at the end, when he's getting some wealth, why are you so envious about that? <laughs> well, here's the thing. In order for him, and keep in mind, he only owns 17% of Amazon. So that's all the other but, empires he has. <laughs> yeah. And so he had to create millions of millionaires to become a billionaire himself. He, yeah. he changed the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, give people jobs, like created all like investors, you know, investors that invest in Amazon made a lot of money through that whole pathway. He had to do so much like not Grinding. damage, but just <clears throat> so many things had to happen for that for that one success. And um, so, yeah, I, I like to think about business in terms of solving problems, and I, and it's it often becomes solving problems on many wavelengths: solving problems for your employees, solving problems for your organization, solving problems for your users, solving problems for yourself, solving problems for your family. The uh. And that's a challenge. And that's, that's, that's why I like business because it's a constant uh, moving thing that you participate in. You're engaged in it all the time. Um, it's a little different than like a video game that has a beginning and an end. Like you, you play a video game, you get pretty good at it, you beat it and that's it. Or maybe you continue playing it online and you compete, but then eventually you become the best and then you beat everybody else. And then there's nobody to play against. And then there's no challenge. Business has a infinite challenge. It just keeps getting crazier and crazier. And that's why you see like Elon Musk is like, okay, well, what next? So I guess we'll just go to Mars. Let's figure that out. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, that's, that's what I love. That's what I love being a part of. And I think that if you want to be good in business, you have to have that kind of curiosity, that, that never ending um, desire to just go to the next level. Like, will you not allow me to ask you any, any more questions? <coughs> <laughs> how do you deal with criticism and hate yourself? Like, do you listen to that or how do you deal with it? Uh, what, what was the question? Oh, criticism and hate. Is that what you said? Um, yeah. So I struggle with that. And, and I've definitely uh, dealt with that. Like, I've had some uh, not so great moments. Um, figuring out how to react to that. Now what I do is I just think of it this way. If you are doing anything that's worth doing, people will hate you. Uh, there will be haters along the way. Uh, if you don't have any haters, I would take that as a sign that you 
haven't put yourself out there far enough. Worthwhile, yeah. Huh? yeah, yeah, because you can't please everybody, and there's always two two sides yeah. of a coin. And yeah. so, with anything, there's always going to be some haters, and it, it's I don't let it affect me because, on one hand, I'll listen to it because I'll be like, okay, maybe there's some truth behind the hate, and that that's usually hate does come from a place of, um you know, somebody having a different perspective than you or, and, and I think you can learn from that. I think that you can, if you, if you learn how to step back from the hate and pretend that you're not the one that's being hated on, it's, it's the essence of you or the thing that you're doing is being hated on. You can kind of reverse engineer that and, and think of, okay, maybe it's because, you know, it wasn't that great or, uh, maybe it's just is not for that person. This is not for them. This is something that is for a different type of person. You have to kind of think of it like outside of your own, uh, you have to remove yourself from the situation and think of it from an external Total third person party perspective, unbiased <clears throat> point of view. And I use that as a tool to better inform me for future decisions and to help me uh, choose. Uh, sometimes I'll ignore it. Sometimes I will listen to the feedback and, and actually make better choices but uh for people who let it affect them emotionally i think it's that is the most damage that you're doing to yourself because if you can't take criticism then you will never be able to get the the constructive feedback necessary to improve uh you know if you're if you're at a level 54 and you want to get to a level 55 something has to change and sometimes hate can reveal that or criticism can reveal that um that change that might need to happen and other times it doesn't but it's worth listening to and it's it's worth thinking about but don't let it affect you emotionally because then you never really get to iterate or improve or take the next step um because you're so worried about people hating you which is just uh it slows you down holds you back hmm. probably the last question on the podcast <laughs> See, see, people who are watching see the smile on Joey's face. He's like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I try to make sure that, because I'm I'm cognizant that people are looking at me. So I'm like, well, I don't want to have a bitch resting face. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's laugh. <laughs> yeah. Plus, I'm ex- enjoying the conversation. So. Yeah, man, me too. I mean. As I said, I would have to, just to I have to mail you once again for mentorship. So yeah, don't worry, I'll disturb you a lot. Uh, <coughs> just don't uh, mark me as spam on the mail. That that's <laughs> no 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 no. The question is three advices um, from your own experience that all artists and creative people, or maybe creative business owners, or let's put it in a broad perspective, creative people. So musicians, artists, dancers, painters, business people, all come under creative people can apply and uh, immediately apply from your own experience. From my own experience, well, I have some principles that I think I can share that might help. And, and one is going to be about money as much as I don't think that people should be so obsessed about money but money does run the world you need money to live you need you've got to make a living right so with money my principle is not oh i can't afford that oh i can't get that or that's too expensive instead of that think how do i afford that how can i have enough money to make that not expensive to me how can i afford the things that i want to buy that is a mentality that i have towards money um and i think a lot of people have the opposite they're always <laughs> oh no that's too expensive i shouldn't spend yeah. money on that or no it's like no other way around how do i get it how do how do i make more money so that i can have that thing how do i cuz it could even just be an investment in your business how do i uh you know how do i get my first 10 grand so i can start this business let me think of ways to do that um maybe i can donate some of my time uh maybe i can mow lawns maybe i can sell books i don't know you know, figure it out, think about it that way. The second thing I'll say is the the quicker and earlier you can discover your own mission statement, 
and I'll explain what that is in a second, the the faster you will be on track to focusing on exactly what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it. So for me, and I didn't figure this out until uh, I think my 30s, uh, my mission statement one night, I was just sitting there and I was thinking to myself and I was like, why do I do all this stuff? Why am I doing the plugins? Why am I making the records? And I figured out that it's to help people make great music. It's such a simple sentence, but that's my mission statement. I help people make great music. There's a lot of ways that I do that. I do it with software. I do it with education. I do it as a music producer. I do and it as a musician. Done, I get the money. <clears throat> yes. So the quicker you can figure out what is your mission statement, then everything that gets thrown at you, opportunities, questions, um, you know, curiosity, all of those things can be answered with the alignment of your mission statement. So if somebody comes yep. to me and says, Joey, have this amazing invention. It makes your car go faster and it's really cheap. And I need $10,000 to get started to create this thing. It's a prototype, blah, 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 blah. Will you help me? Uh, is that going to help me make, help people make great music? No. Okay. I'm not doing it then. Cause that goes away from your focus. You have a circle of focus. This is how much, focus you have every day and it's like over here and the more things you put inside that circle the more slices there are and the more slices there are the tinier those slices get and then that's how much focus and attention each one of those little things get inside your circle of focus so if you don't align yourself with that then you'll keep going down different paths that take you away from the the direction and the alignment that you want to go to accomplish the thing that you originally set out to do or the area that you want to focus in so that's why i always say figure out your mission statement quick. The faster you do that, the more time you have to put into that one thing and really crush it better than anyone else. Because you're, if you spend more time on the one thing that you want to do and spend more time on it than anyone else, then you'll be the person doing it. That's so important. Yeah, so, and the third thing I think is, uh, it's, it's kind of going back to the passion and the discipline, um, you know, you need those things to kind of drive you through the tough times. I think that uh, anybody who is on a, an epic journey uh, of success is going to have those moments where they have their self doubt or there's obstacles that seem infinitely impossible to overcome. And that's when the passion helps continue to drive you to keep going. Um, you know, for me, it kind of comes back to like, you know, I'm, I'm 38 years old. Am I going to completely stop doing music and just do a whole new industry? That seems seems kind of silly, right? So I think when you're young, it's easy to kind of like have a different send off point. Like you're like, oh well, I'm I'm only I'm 22. I could do anything. Like, but the the quicker you uh, align your mission with your passion, it is the faster that you can run in that direction of that bullseye and that that's what i think that like you just have to find what that is for you because you know if you're not passionate about it uh it'll always be this other thing in your life but if you are passionate about it, it becomes your life and that's why people always ask me like joey how do you balance your schedule it's like it, it mm -hmm. is my schedule you know it's not a balance it's i like business it's a part of me it's a part of my existence you know joe uh, all these businesses kind of are me it's the joey sturgis productions and the joey sturgis tones and the even urm academy started in my forum in facebook my my facebook forum my group so um yeah there is no balancing it's just like because i'm doing what i am i'm doing what i love and i i hope that other people get to discover that for themselves and get to actually do that in their lifetimes I think that's the third part, the secret of really obtaining that success. How big is your team? And in, in JST, Drum Forge, and your academy mixed? Um, All together, we're probably around 25, 30 people. Um, around half of that is, is the software, and then the other half is the education. Um, and... <clears throat> You know, it's it's a learning curve to figure out how to grow a team of that size and, yeah. and how to keep, keep right it people. functional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I've learned a lot recently, just in the last six months to the year, just learning how to even like hire and fire people. I never really had to do it. So um, 
but you know, people, we, we had a graphic designer, for example, he was kicking ass, but then he was like, you know what? I want to be a vocalist. I don't want to be a graphic. Well, I'm, I'm going to keep doing graphic design, but my full time, I want my full time thing to be a, a, a vocalist. And it's like, Okay, well, I guess I have to learn how to like hire new graphics people and then figure out how to tr- well, like then you're interview do this, them. Just this walk. Huh? Yeah, and it's you know just another thing to learn. <laughs> so simple. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not that great at everything. That's the thing. Like uh, you know mm-hmm. uh, that you you just got to jump in the deep end. You know, learn how to swim. That's that's my mentality. Just go for it. Figure it out. Well, on that note, uh, for the people who are watching this, who will be watching this, um, well, as I already said at the beginning, he doesn't need an introduction. All of the products and companies he, have, he has built himself doesn't need an introduction. I'll leave all the links possible in the description. Please do check them out. Uh, buy some plugins for your next mix. And uh, I will not thank you because you have adjusted a lot for me for this podcast. So... I'll not thank you. You have done more than thanks to me. So, but once again, like, thank you so very much for joining, man. It means a lot. A lot yeah. to learn from yeah. you. Got a, uh, like any advice for me as well. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 more than welcome. I'm I'm happy to be here, and I hope that this podcast will help inspire some people. And um, my final words of advice is: start before you're ready. Uh, you'll never be ready, so just get started, and you'll learn you'll see the how that you'll learn along the way. That's right. Joey Sturge is part two. <laughs> Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you so me. much, man. Thanks. Thank you so much. Have a great day, man. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Cheers.